So I'm gradually going to take us back a little bit to protein structure, because in particular in this class, we want to use bioinformatics to better understand protein structure. One very important measure that you've already used in the lab, but that we're going to talk more about today, is RMSD, root mean square displacement or deviation, that I define like this. I'm going to need a large bracket here. So I take the sum of all atoms n in a particular protein, and then I need to calculate xi minus xi ref squared plus iy minus iy ref squared needs to be longer plus zi minus zi ref squared and then divide that by the number of residues. I think I got that right. What this tells us, if the reference here, that would be for instance my target, the known X-ray structure, while Xi is my prediction or where I'm running in a simulation. The whole idea here is what this is then going to measure is kind of the average error between two structures. If this error is one angstrom, that means that the average error of any atom corresponds to roughly the length between a carbon and a hydrogen. That's nothing. It's an amazing structure. If it's two, three angstroms, it's a pretty good structure, quite usable. At three, pharmaceutical companies will start complaining. At five, all bets are not quite off and uh, it's, it's bad. And at six, seven, you don't have any similarity at all. So. When we talk about models, we're somehow going to relate this to RMSD and say how good they are. There are a few other ways that we can measure scores that I won't define, but there's one called GDT. Uh, it's called Global Distance Test. Uh, that goes from 0 to 100, and I would say that zero, at 0 we don't have any similarity at all. 70, 80, really good. And at 90, that would be an experimental structure. So if two structures have a GDT of 90, that means that they're basically experimental. That's as good as it gets. There is a reason for mentioning that. Now I will come back to it later. For now, you can forget about it. The RMSD, it turns out, is intimately related to the sequence similarity, not one on one, but on average. So if we plot the expected sequence conservation versus the RMS, it turns out that if I'm, well, of course, if I'm at 100% per sequence identity, the RMSD should be zero, right? But already when I have, say, 75% of the residues in the core of the protein identical, I should expect this RMSD to be in the order of 0.5. So if only 25% of the residues differ, it's exactly the same structure. And then this will, of course, go up. If, but even if only 25% of my structures match, I actually expect, on average, to be within 1.5 angstrom RMSD. The take-home message of this plot is twofold. First, you don't need as much identity as you think. Three out of four residues can be different, and they will still have the same structure, on average. Very few exceptions. Second, it's a gliding scale. If we have 80% identity, it's of course better than if you only have 20. But uh, you should be fairly certain about this fairly early. This is probably worth writing down. We occasionally talk about this, that some sort of scale. And then we can say percent identity sequence. Now, of course, there is a difference here, right? Identity just, just counts if things are really identical, alanine to alanine. There is a difference if you replace an alanine with a tryptophan or an alanine with a glycine, but for now, this is an average, so we don't care. So if we start from zero and go maybe up to, so we say, 20, then the second zone might go up to, say, 40, and well, then all the way up to 100. Here we are sad. This is so-called midnight zone. Below 20% sequence identity, 
I can't really say anything. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust it. That doesn't mean that the sequences are not homologous. It's just that I, I can't say for certain. If you are from roughly 40% sequence identity, we are very happy. This is a so-called safe zone. If you have 40% sequence identity in those sequences, they will be homologous. I would almost say that I'm going to eat my left shoe if that's not true. But remember that I showed you in a previous lecture that it might be possible for us to design something up here. But again, that's an exception. If you have 40% identity between two sequences, they're going to have the same fold. But that leaves this interesting area. This is the so-called twilight zone, or it used to be the twilight zone. I would actually argue that these limits have moved down. In the twilight zone, we might be able to determine structures of proteins if we're lucky. And I would actually argue that this has narrowed a bit. So that the twilight zone is probably from 20 to 30 percent. From 30 percent, I would be considered quite safe, and I would probably trust homology already at 30 percent mostly because we've had better and better algorithms to detect sequence similarity and evolutionary patterns, but we'll come back to that. The short story here, if somebody shows you these sequences and they have 30% sequence identity or better, you should believe that they have the same fold. Once they only have 20%, you're looking at noise, don't trust it. This twilight zone is fairly narrow, but this is of course where a lot of the fascinating research happens. That's how we move down from 40 to 30 here. So how similar is similar? If a couple of proteins share 30% sequence, what will they look like? I have an example of exactly that for you. Three sequences here, they share just under 30% uh, of the uh, residues. As you will see, they're not, they're not exactly identical. There are some minor differences here. Uh, in particular, that helix is a bit turned. Uh, the fold is the same. You have the same number of secondary structure elements, but there are some minor changes relative to them. This is quite typical, uh, but remember, this is 30%. It might even be a bit of a large change for 30%. You can, if these are so similar at 30%, you should guess what happens if two things are 80% identical. You would not be able to tell them apart. This will now enable us to use bioinformatics, in particular homology and sequence similarity, as a way to detect in practice the things we've talked about in physics. Because remember, all, these, all my discussions about fold, similarity, evolution, it's completely true what I told you in the physics lecture, but the only way for us to know it then was if we actually had those entire folds, right? What bioinformatics now enables me to do is get those directly from sequence if I only have 30% identity and I have 207 million really good sequences in the Uniprot data bank today.